Half of my book is bad and the other ha half is how my life changed. So it talks about, you know, uh, gang banging, right. drug dealing, and um, uh, teenage pregnancy. It talks about a whole lot of stuff. And that's why I said half of it, you know, when somebody reads it, it's bad. And the other half, they'll figure out, you know, how my life all of a sudden changed. So let's talk about your life a little bit, okay? So I read some excerpts of your book. Um, so you were a teen, and you was a teen mom, and you ran the streets, right? Because mm -hmm. um, all of this is open in your book, right? Yes. And you went to prison, right? Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yes. So how old were you when you went to prison? I was 21. 21? I was 21. Uh, where'd you go to prison at? I went to Mabel Bassett oh, wow. and also at Eddie Warriors. So you was at Eddie Warriors and also, so you, you went to two prisons? Uh, yes, and oh. some halfway houses in between that. Okay. How long did you serve? Uh, they gave me a total of eight years, uh, three and a five, which run, ran concurrent. Mm -hmm. Soon as the three was up, you do the five, which equals eight. So, but all together, I served just three years. Just three years? Three years, uh-huh, wow. yes. So you serve in that time in prison, you went in, just kind of let's do a timeline here. You felt like you were gang banging and all that stuff on the streets. You went in prison, right? What shifted inside of you while you were in prison? Because I mean, was, were, were there people talking to you? Were there counselors or was that something that hit you in the face? What, what tripped? for you to say, I gotta change my life? Well, at that moment in 2003, I had, my back was up against the wall. No friends was there. My sister wasn't there. Uh, boyfriends, no, no, nobody was there. It was just me. And my life flashed before my eyes. And I thought about all the dirt, all this stuff, even stuff that I never even got caught for, like selling drugs and all of that. And uh, my life flashed before my eyes and I, I realized that I, it's, it's insanity to keep doing the same things, expecting different results. I, I cried out. I cried out to God. That's, that's what happened. That's my first step that I took. I, I mean, I'm not just saying like just kind of crying to God like, like the other times that when I went to jail and I got right back out, I meant like really, really from the depth of my soul. Like, God, forgive me. I'm sorry. Please come in my heart. Help me. Change my life. Come inside of me. I, I, it's obviously I can't do this by myself. I can't do it alone. I need you. I need a, I need a higher power. So. So you, this was it. This is your first time going to prison? Yes, my okay. first time going to the prison, but I had been in jail. So you've been in jail uh, many times. About four times before the fifth time that I went to prison. Wow. So yeah. you were in jail four times. And then the fifth time you went to prison. The fifth time I went to prison. Yes. So during those four times, you said previously you would cry out, but it, what, what was different? Was it, was it prison that, that, Hey, I'm not getting out of here. What, what faced you? I no, mean, no, because, okay. because I didn't even know that I wasn't getting out. So this, uh, uh, event, this, this supernatural event that I'm talking about, happened uh, just about immediately. Uh, I don't know if it was at one, two, three, four, five, maybe one week or somewhere in between that time. As soon as I got there, this like really immediately happened to me and I didn't know because I, I didn't know they were gonna keep me because I had to wait for my court date. So before my court date came and before I even knew that they were gonna keep me and ship me off to prison, to the big prison, you didn't know you didn't know you were going to big prison. I, I didn't know. I had already talked to God and made the change within me. It starts within a person. And that's So this was before you actually went to prison. This was in county. This was in Tulsa County Jail. Wow. Yes. Okay. So Retail, you I mean, listen, you have a lot of people out here who say, I went to prison, I found God. It just seems more cliche. -ish. That's what we hear a lot. What makes you different? Because what makes your experience at that time different? Uh, because it, it was a real experience. Like, like the previous times I just kind of said, well, God, you know, come on now, if you would just get me out of here. And then all of a sudden they call in my name, Ratia, pack your stuff. You're out. And, and it, it was just some words and I was out 
and I was back on the road doing the same things. But this time it was different and I knew it was different because there was really a change inside of me to where um, I'm not just living any kind of way like I previously did. Like God gave me a hunger to read the Bible and to learn of the Bible and to figure out who I am. Uh, which while being in, incarcerated in the jail, I figured out that I'm a, I'm a prayer warrior person. I am a minister person that can talk to people about God and, and, and their forth. So some people will watch this and they would say you hit rock bottom. Would you say that going to prison was your, cause you had mentioned no friends, no, no family. Was that your rock bottom at that time? Well, you know, I would, I would consider that being my rock bottom because my back was up against the wall. Nobody was there. And I, and I, I all I, I, it came across my, my mind. It was just there. All this stuff that I did, all this stuff, you know, robbing, stealing, you know, in a gang, uh, uh, gang affiliated teenage pregnancy, stealing out of stores, all of this stuff. And it, 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 my time came, it had to come to an end. I mean, it was my choice. You know, just like, um, I believe God gives everybody their own choice, you know, and he doesn't force us. He didn't force me. I really wanted it. So that day you got out, what did you do? The day that I got, the I got out released. Day, release, um, I, um, caught the, did I catch the Greyhound bus over to my mom's. Yeah. Couldn't wait to see my son and my family. So wow. mm -hmm. and your relationship with your son today. It's that, how is that? Cause you was a teen mom and you went in. How is that relationship? Um, yeah, when I got out, I got to taking care of my son and, um, uh, we started going to church and uh, doing things, going out to eat, you know, building back up a relationship and, you know, I'd have his birthday parties and whatever he needed, you know, um, that went very well. So you, know? you, you get out of prison and you're like a changed person now. It's not cliche -ish. You, you're, you're a change person. You hit the ground running. It sounds like, is that cool? Is that what happened? That's what happened. Okay. Yeah. Um, so let's move fast forward. You now, you, you developed your ministry and you're feeding the hungry, right? Is yeah. that correct? Yes. So why, why, why are you doing that? Because it's a passion. And before I even talk about the homeless, we've got to start out with the prisoners Okay. <laughs> because okay. I was well, once a prisoner. I'm, I'm so. okay with that. Now, <laughs> yes. Let's talk about that. Yeah. Now, let's so, talk about that. Absolutely. So before we go to the homeless, did you go back to, 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 with your prison ministry? Uh, yes, I actually, um, I had God put, you know, gave a desire for me to, um, go ahead and get the, um, department of correction badge. Cause you have to get the badge first and then you can go in and you can minister and pray for the inmates. So, um, I was once there. So I, that was my desire to go back in, uh, with other groups and to give the prisoners hope and to tell them that, you know, I was once here, you know, and, uh, God did it for me, you know, and it worked out for me and the, it's the same opportunity for you. So wait a minute, you, you get out, you, you have an opportunity for your family. And you go back to go help people? <laughs> yes. You know, absolutely. some people would, come on, Retia, some people would turn around and be like, I'm gone. I don't want the smell of prison. I don't even want <laughs> nothing to do with that. What gave you that burning desire to say, you know, I got to go reach my sisters? What was that? Wow. I mean, you know, if you've been in prison and you really got yourself together, why not go back and lift other people? out from where you came from. So that's just the way I looked at it. You know, I was there. I, I know how it is that you have to go in your, in your, in the dorm. It's like, it looks, it looks like a college. You have to go in the dorm. You've got to, um, leave and go eat in the cafeteria. You can go walk around this gigantic, uh, compound on the yard. Mm -hmm. I know, you know, I know how, I know what they're going through is what I'm saying. I know that they have to eat at a certain time and sleep at a certain time and wake up early in the morning and go, you know, you get a job and work on the yard, you know? Um, but I know how it is. That's my point. And so I just simply wanted to go and pray and, and, and give other ladies hope, you know, there's hope for you. So what, you know, what, what did they say? Cause I know many people were like, you care for me. I mean, tell me some of those stories that, 
you know, you're meeting these ladies, now they're, you're going back and you're reaching back. What, what are some of the stories they're telling you? You don't have to mention names, just some of the st stories that they're telling you. I mean, what's the responses that they're telling you? Well, I, um, at times I would go in with different groups and um, uh, I would be given the opportunity to come up and to pray. And some of the ladies had very, very, very long sentences. And some of them remembered me when I was there. So that within itself was a total real big blessing, you know, for them to know and, and recognize my face and say, Hey, you know, wow. You know, I'm, you know, they're, cause they're still in there. Wow. You come back and you, you want to be a blessing, you know? So that's, that, that really, um, um, you know, helped me know that what I'm doing is not in vain. You know, it's, 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 it's for a purpose. It's on purpose to go. And so there was different opportunities of me going with different groups. Right. Also, um, before, uh, Turley halfway house closed down here. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was open and different people would come in and they would have church and, you know, like I used to go. Also, I remember some times where my son went, he went with me, he volunteered with me and, uh, I cooked some breakfast for the ladies and brought it to them as well as some angel bags I gave to them. And, um, uh, I spoke and I prayed and some of them remembered me and it just gives them hope and to let them know that this lady is here. She was in this very same facility and look what God is doing in her life. So it makes them, you know, take a different look at their life saying, Hey, now I need to put my faith in God or I need to continue to hold on to God because look at her and, and I, God has something for me too. It's not just her, you know, he died so, for us all. <laughs> so those, those ladies who are, who are there, um, I'm pretty sure they feel like because you are giving them hope, you're letting them know once you get out, this is, you can make that. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you're talking to women who maybe be lifers or, or, or maybe are lifers or maybe who are um, people who have done some bad things. And I'm pretty sure they come to you and like, yo, how is your God going to forgive me I can't even forgive myself. And so um, I, I've ran across uh, situations like that. And all I could do is just refer back, uh, you know, to, to what the word of God says. You know, that's what still helps me till today. If I didn't have the word of God, I probably would, probably would it have ended up back in prison. You have to keep the word in you. So but what I'm saying is that people, they um, they receive hope and they know that um, God has something bigger than, you know, than, than, than what they're currently facing. You know, even, even some people that are in for, for a lifetime, you, you, you still can change. And I've also saw miracles happen to where people had life sentences. They, they've gotten released. Really? Yeah. You know, their life has been flipped upside down and changed around and they're doing great. They're doing wonderful things and they can, you know, never forget what God has done for them. Really? Yeah. So you have a, you move from that and you also still doing the women's ministry, but you move to the homeless ministry. So tell me a little bit about that. Yes. The homeless ministry, um, it started out in 2015. Yeah. It started out in 2015 where I go and I help the homeless. They get angel bags and somebody might be wondering, well, what is an angel bag? Well, it's a gallon size, uh, Ziploc bag and it contains things of like little snacks and stuff, little tuna fishes or Roman noodles or bottle of water and stuff like that to bless them with. And so they, they, they hear the word of God. I preach first and then I pray, get some souls saved and they get clothes, they get angel bags, they get shoes. And so I take donations. Uh, that's how I'm able to pass it out. Cause I take donations and I do fundraisers for all what I do. So I read a, a section in your book, how you would sneak into your friend's houses and a friend room and all. Yeah. Is your connections, because did you used to stay on the street? Is that where you get the connection to help the homeless? Uh, well, you know, there's some different situations that happened in my life. First, I would say when I was younger um, with my mom, like, well, first my parents, they were, um, they were uh, 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 together, they were married, they were together, and they, they did raise us up in a Christian home. My big brother, me, my sister that's just a year younger than me, and the baby sister is 10 years younger than us. So she wasn't born yet, but, uh, yes. Yeah, so, um, uh, it, it all happened with that. That's, that's what helped me, uh, come back to God. So, so you have that, 
Because you had that experience about I, people he, living on the streets, and he, you understand that. And so after that, that's when, um, uh, after they were um, married, they, something happened, they got a divorce is what I'm saying. And somewhere in that particular time when I was younger, I stayed in shelters with my mom and my, and my sister. Right. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So, so if you are talking to, there are a lot of parents who were probably be watching this, and they have teenagers that are just crazy, you know, they don't know what to do with them. And what would be something that you would say to them in reference to how to understand a teenager or what type of help could you offer them? Maybe not through your ministry services, but, but just, just from experiences, what would you offer them? Uh, just from, advice. Uh, yes, just to try to really do the right thing because if you get out here and you're not listening to your parents and uh, you just get out here and go wild and crazy and team up with another friend that's uh, into stealing or, you know, um, gang banging and all of that. You're going to get in, you know, and the guys, you know, um, teenage pregnancy could happen. You know, you could end up getting in trouble with the law. So I would just say just, you know, just just be patient and listen to uh, your mom, your dad or uh, whoever's raising you. It could be your grandma raising you or auntie. A uncle or whatever, just listen because um, a lot of times, you know, like me, when I was younger, I didn't really want to listen because I thought that my mom or, you know, older people were just being mean and trying to like tell me what to do because they're, they're the parent or the guardian, which in all in reality, uh, uh, we love y'all and we want the best for y'all. We don't want y'all out here getting in trouble and you got to go get locked up and all of that. So just listen, just listen because we're older than y'all and we know. We know we we've got we've got more experience. So just listen. Good. You you're doing all of this. Why? I mean, just stay with me for a second, because this is service. This is work. This is labor. Why? because it's not like I don't have anything else better to do. It's just that it's a, it's a burden on me in a good way. Okay. It's a desire now, mm -hmm. now that the old have been pushed and moved out of the way, this is a new life for me. So I actually find pleasure in going out. Now, right now, due to what's going on in the worldwide pandemic, of course, no DOC volunteers are able to come in to the prisons right now. So they're um, working on getting everything back together so the volunteers can uh, resume on where we left off. But um, I still have teamed up with a, a young prison. And when I say young prison, I mean the juvenile detention center mm -hmm. where they're able to get off of my book sales. They I'll donate a book to them and, uh, and or 10 Bibles you know, from the store, I just go buy 10 Bibles or I can donate a book. And so they're being um, blessed um, by that. And I've gotten some good feedback from some of the staff that work there. What made you write the book? Um, to just, just keep it real and tell the whole world what happened because people need to know my story. They have to know what happened to me. People need to know people they're, they're, uh, I've gotten a lot of good feedback. People have been really blessed. People have been encouraged. They've been strengthened by reading a book from me, Retia Rogers. You know, I broke out of prison, you know. Why'd you choose that? Why'd you choose the title, I broke out of prison? God gave me that. Okay. He gave me that. Because um, I am not the same, I'm not the same Tia, you know. Tia is my nickname. They get Tia from Retia, right? Okay. right. And so I'm not, I, I'm just, I'm different. My, it, it starts with the mindset. It starts from within. So I'm, I'm just a different person and mm -hmm. God w put it on my heart to go ahead and write, not just any book, but be, you know, be on purpose, you know, with this. And I, I said, okay, I, I, I want to write it. He gave me the desire. And so, but, um, before I wrote it, I was kind of like, it's kind of like when someone's getting in a pool and you know, it's going to, it's going to, it's going to be a little cold and it gives you that, ah, you know, that little, little scream, like, ah, oh, so little, so I, I was kind of like, ah, wait a minute. No, they can't know all this. Well, okay. Okay. I, I got it. God, I'm going to do it. And I'm like, ah, no, you know, but I went through and it's here and it's been here since 2019. 
So yes, it, it takes a lot to become to become vulnerable. Period. To trust someone, but you're spilling your soul out on paper for anyone to see you, to judge you, and to to look at you. How were you able to overcome all of that? Because a lot of people have gone through so much, and they may be afraid to tell the world what happened to them. Oh, um, wow. How is it that you were able to take your vulnerability to pen and pad and express it, and now you're exposing yourself? It wasn't me. It was the God in me prompting me or telling me to push forward and write this book. You're, you're not going to write any book. You're, you're going to write the book. You can write many books after this, but I, I'm, 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 I'm speaking to you now about writing this book because people need to know what happened to you. People need to know that how, how come you're not the same no more is because of me. People need to know that. So you got to get your story out there and you need to start writing and you, you need to stick to it. You know, I need you to write this time. I need you to write this time of night. You don't feel like it. I give you something in your mind. You need to wake up and hear up and write that down. So when the next day come, you can put that down on, on, on the spiral. So it, it, it had to come out. And like I said, it just, Sometimes it kind of felt like I'm about to jump in the pool and get that that cool that make you just ah you know and it's, it's like okay ah and it's like ah no 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 it's like ouch and it's like okay and I just finally just I stopped going back and forth like hey here it is so this is your garden in Gethsemane moment right here this is the moment where that you know many Christians will say that Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane and he didn't want to go on the cross. And he was fighting back and forth. So here you having that moment right there between you and God, it's like you're putting your pad. It sounds like you're doing this out of obedience. Is that correct? Am I correct on that? I would say that, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wow. What's your hope for people when they see you, read your book? Uh, to know that um, a lot of times um, things that are ugly or disastrous, uh, or, or, or big catastrophe can happen in your life before things get better or even turn beautiful. And things are beautiful for you. You're yeah. married, you said you have a, your husband, you have your family, and you know, you know there, there's a saying that I don't look like I, what I have gone through. I mean, the picture on there, that's you, right? This is me at 21. She was 21. And this is you now. I mean, when you look at that picture, what is that? What, how, what do you, what does that say to you when you see a reflection of yourself and you see that now? That God can change anybody. You just have to be willing. Yeah. It's very powerful. It's very powerful. Um, your ministry, how often are you doing your homeless program? Um, it started out once a week. And in 2015, and it's begun to uh, grow and just go out once a month and um, just to be a blessing uh, to the homeless. Uh, I was just out there about four or five days ago. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, mm -hmm. And um, you, you want people, how can people help? Because people are going to watch this. They're going to be like, I, I actually like her vibe. I, li I like her. How can they help you? They want to send you some money to help you with your ministry. How can they help you? Well, the way that if anybody would like to get involved, they could just look me up on my website, and that is www.rreministries.org. So what's next for you? What's your next step? Uh, my next step, I want to do more. Um, what's been on my heart lately is to go around and to do more traveling, mm. to talk about my story, uh, sell a bunch of books, uh, just travel around, do different tours, and um, work on a, a documentary film about my life. Yes, wow. mm -hmm. so my heart, so. But Rutier, I mean, is there anything that I didn't cover that you wanted to get out? Um, I know we kind of hit a lot of things. Is there anything that I didn't cover? 
Um, I would like to say, um, if you think that, you know, you can't, uh, share your story or you're not good enough or nobody's going to buy your book or nobody's going to believe you. Um, that's, that's, that's all false. That's, that's false hope. Um, we all, everybody, everybody has a story to, to tell. Everybody has a voice. Everybody has a story. And my voice is in this book. I broke out of prison. And so it's metamorphosis, you know, and that's what really happened to me. But I would just encourage somebody that's been on the back burner. You've been holding back, go ahead and write and share your story. There's somebody that's going to look up to you. There's somebody that's going to get their life totally changed by you, you know, by the God in you through reading your book. And, um, the best is still yet to come. Mm -hmm. You have a mentoring program. I forgot. I, I need to mention that you do have a mentoring program. Right? Yes. So, right? Mm -hmm. And you mentor the at risk youth or, or, or people who are on halfway houses? Who, how do, who do you mentor? Well, it's people on, I have a, there's a, a link on my website. And if anybody would like to be mentored, um, all they would have to do is just pick a time and a date on my calendar that's available for me on my days. And they could be mentored. And, and I'm not just saying it has to be in person. We could, um, I, they could be mentored over the phone and they would just simply have to go to my website and, um, you know, think about that. And if they wanted to get connected, they could go to my website, they could check it out and they can schedule a time to be mentored, you know? And also I encourage you, if you go on my website, go ahead and pick up the book and read it. So you can get, you can, you can learn about me. You can know about my story, you know? Yeah, so many people who, again, who get out, they come back home and are not received. And then they are wayward. And then sometimes they actually go back. Um, one of the stories I remember interviewing a guy one time and he was saying that the DL was like, I see you again, you know. Um, and, he, and he kept that in the back of his mind mm. because he knew that he did not want to see that DL again. Um, but you came back home and you were received. Was that due to the fact that you had a good support structure in your family? No, absolutely not. Okay. No, I don't have a good support system in my family. Okay. No, not at all. Okay. Mm -mm. So what made you want to come back? Because you came back to the place where you got in trouble at, I mean, in Tulsa. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Because most people would be like, I'm, I'm done. I can't start my life out in a city that I got in trouble with. But you are a testimony to say that you can't. You can, it can happen. Wow. Mm -hmm. Even though you may pass some of those things that draw your memory and say, Hey, I remember hanging out in that corner. I remember doing mm -hmm. this. What kept you focused? I mean, is you, you're a fascinating individual because you're very strong willed and a lot of people can't do this. I know, I guess we have to come back to the God, right? Yes. <laughs> to the God in you, right? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, I, I, I just want to say thank you for what you do, your your ministry, and all of the the work that you do because it is labor. It's 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 a labor. It's ser it's service, and um and thank you you know for doing this for the community. Thank you for reaching out to other people who are deeming these people to be unreachable. Hmm. One last question before I let you go. When you were there in prison and other ladies that are there in prison. How did you escape the inhumane mental anguish that one feels when they are in prison as if that they're not human? How did you escape that? Hmm. Well, it, everything that I learned uh, brand new and everything, it all referred back to the Bible because, um, you know, like I said, before my parents got divorced when I was younger, they did train us up. I was little, four or five years old, somewhere around there. But um, when that ex when that mir miraculous experience happened for me, it brought everything back to when I was a little girl. But um, uh, it just, it, it just, it, it, I, I had, for me, I had to be in the Bible. I had to uh, be praying and God was using me to pray for other ladies, to get souls saved, to get people, um, 
to get people delivered so and healed. Doing work. I'm doing I'm actually doing work on the field. It's like a college. It's a large, humongous, gigantic compound that a bunch of inmates are walking back and forth. People are talking, laughing, reminiscing, whatever they got going on. But I'm I'm out doing God's work. And there were a few of us doing that there. Everybody else had their own agendas and things going on. I just I, I stayed pl- a lot of a lot of things that helped me was fasting. I'll tell you that fasting, declining food from the cafeteria and just using that time period while everybody's out talking, laughing, eating lunch or dinner, whatever. A lot of times I would fast and I wouldn't go and I would I would spend that time with God. And um, uh, that's that's what helped me getting into the word, uh, praying uh, actually living it and, and doing a lot of fasting, fasting from food and crying out to God. I was a lot of times when I had like a, uh, uh, when I was at the top bunk, I had a lower bunkie. I would pray. I would get on my knees and pray on her, a uh, bunkie on her, on her bunkie. Mm-hmm. And, uh, she was an answer prayer because she never told me, Hey, get up. You don't need to be praying on, on my bunkie. It was never any of that. She never said anything mm-hmm. about that. So I, you know, and that's just, that's just me. Per- Nobody has to get on their knees and pray. That's just me. It's just, it's just what, what you have. That's just what I, what I, what, what I do between right. me and God. Right. But, um, to say that all is just, just staying in God, just stay going to church. The church services, uh, happen all the time at prisons and the ministers would come in and preachers. I would go and attend that. So God just kept me from going off, going, uh, uh, going, uh, going crazy. God just kept me because a person can, uh, I almost had a fight, but it didn't happen. I thank God. And a lot of times when people do get into a fight, they get more time added on. So then therefore there's more time being away from your baby or your babies and your family. So, um, I, I just, it's, it, it all just points back up to God. I mean, this, <laughs> and I'm an answered prayer. My mom always used to tell me that they prayed for me. Mm-hmm. All right, there's a, there's a saying, um, my mom used to say all the time, like we are standing on the prayers of those who prayed for us mm. previously. Yes. Um, one last thing, um, are you, if churches or faith-based organization want to team up with you, are you willing to do that? Because there's a lot of ministries who want to do a prison ministry, but they don't have the knowledge of it. You know, they just have the, the need for it, but they don't have the knowledge. Will your ministry team up with other other churches and other organizations to work with them with their prison ministry? Well, you know, um, I would say if the opportunity would come and if everything worked out, other um, churches, like you said, they could possibly be a part of what I do, of my organization. I run a 501c3 nonprofit organization. And not only do I do uh, a few of the things that we just discussed, but I'm also involved in yearly back to school events, um, going out into some of the projects. I'm not ashamed to say when I was younger, I lived in Comanche Park apartments uh, with my mom. And uh, uh, a lot of times I go back there and I give out groceries and clothes to be a blessing and tell people my story. And some of them cry and they hug me. One particular time, I went out, this was some years back. I went out to Comanche Park Apartments to be a blessing and to give some clothes and, and some food sacks and stuff. And, and uh, one of the ladies lived in the exact same apartment that my mom and, and, and we lived in. We li- and, and it was her birthday. And she said she prayed, she didn't have anything. And she was able to get blessed from my ministry on her birthday, living in the exact same apartment that I lived in with my mom and my sisters and my brother. Mm-hmm. You are definitely an angel. That's all I have. Thank you so much, Atia.